From miracle workers to martyrs, to those ordinary people living extraordinary lives of heroic virtue, these are the people that make us wonder if someday they might be saints. Adele Louise Marie de Mondat Grance was born in the Chateau Grance in Burgundy in 1837, the fifth child of the Count and Countess of Grance. Her family had noble and holy bloodlines with popes such as Clemens VI and Gregory XI, and saints like the great Marian devote Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. But even more prominent was the scholarly and saintly abbot of Cluny, Pierre the Venerable, the first to translate the Quran into Latin and French. There are different things written by family members and people in her community that testify to her holiness. They say that at the age of five, she was showing extraordinary means of leaving the castle as a very young girl all by herself, going out to minister to the poor and to the sick. Sister Marie came from an extremely wealthy family. And as many families uh, at that time period, they were already preparing who their children would marry. And Sister Marie was such a vivacious, fun, loving, wonderful person that they knew that she would be able to marry someone who was quite tremendous. But she knew that she was going to be marrying the King of Kings. And even though she was going to be getting rid of her title, she was going to become a servant and a servant of the poor. She, uh, she lived uh, and found her vocation in a time of great turmoil in France in which the church was facing a lot of persecution, restriction of religious freedom, and uh, she nevertheless was not thwarted. She was a person of great um, confidence in God and, um, and a great courage, it seems to me, and, uh, and really was single-minded in doing the will of God. Sister Marie entered the Daughters of Charity Mother House as a postulant in 1857. She was there for one year, and she started to learn to be a nurse and a pharmacist. In 1858, she had her first assignment to Irsay Lally, near the Belgian border, where she served for 12 years. During the Franco-Prussian War, the Sisters of Charity did not have the necessary funds to purchase the supplies to run their hospital. But Sister Marie was able to look out for the medical needs of her patients by calling upon her connections to high society to help defray the costs. After she was in Air Sar Lali, she was given a second assignment to Le Pec, and that was in one of the suburbs outside of Paris. And there was a wonderful book that became a bestseller, and it was written by on the notes of Clemens Brentano, a German poet who was the scribe to Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. Anne Catherine Emmerich is a beatified woman who lived in the 1700s and 1800s. She was bedridden, but got mystical visions of traveling the world to holy spots, including to the place where the House of Mary in Ephesus was. She wrote all these things down in a book, The Life of the Virgin Mary, and that book was read by Sister Marie de Mondat Grancy, and she followed those instructions in order to end up finding the true House of Mary. So in 1880, Sister Marie in Le Pec read this book in French. And in the last two chapters, it speaks about the Blessed Virgin Mary traveling with St. John to Ephesus. And that was the moment that the Holy Spirit inspired Sister Marie to leave France and to go and find this house, this holy home built by St. John. It's been debated for centuries whether Mary lived her final days in Jerusalem or in Ephesus, and, and there are good arguments on both sides. The Council of Ephesus in 431 AD was held in a church called the Church of Mary. It was the first church in the world ever named for Mary, and it was named at that time, churches were named for saints who lived or died in a specific area. So it gives credibility to the idea that Mary lived in Ephesus, and we think that that's where her Dromitian assumption was from Ephesus. It's also where the council declared Mary Theotokos, or Mother of God, very sacred space. But even today, it's a pretty raw piece of archaeology that needs more restoration. Catherine Emmerich described in her visions the house, the physical layout of the house, the, the floor plan, where the windows were, where the hearth was, 
uh, the shape of the house. Despite her strong desire to immediately leave France to journey to Asia Minor to find the house, Sister Marie, in her vow of obedience as a daughter of charity, would need permission, as Providence would have it. Pope Leo XIII made a call for French missionaries to provide spiritual and medical support to the French, who were on their way to Turkey to build waterworks and roads as part of a business arrangement with the Sultan. So Sister Marie went to her superior and asked for permission to go and answer the call of Pope Leo XIII. God and his providence, he had everything in Lepec, all neat and tidy. All of the orphans that were in the orphanage had grown up, and Sister Marie was closing that orphanage. And so she went off as a French missionary to Turkey to serve the French and Turkish people there as a nurse, pharmacist, and educator and to track down the house of the Virgin Mary. And from the moment she arrived there, she had nothing on her mind but how and when am I going to find the house the Blessed Mother lived in. And she gives the book to the Lazarus priests who run the college in Smyrna in Turkey. It's in their library. Father Poulin, one of the Lazarus priests, reads the book and he is astounded by this revelation that here he thought Mary lived in Jerusalem and he reads this Ephesus story. Sister Marie also approached Father Henry Young, another Lazarus priest who had come to give communion to the sick and say Mass for the sisters. Father Young wanted to disregard the pleading of Sister Marie to consider the writings of Emmerich, but after she persisted and gave him a copy, and he ran into the book again, as well as a discussion of this mystic at Sacred Heart University. He decided to give in to the signs around him and pursue the mystery of the house. So they agreed in order to prove Anne Catherine Emmerich wrong and Sister Marie de Mondon Grance wrong, that they would go on expedition like Sister Marie was asking, and they will show that there is no such house. Instead of following Anne Catherine Emmerich, they started to ask different people in their area, oh, have you ever heard about a holy home? And people started talking about a monastery, so they actually went off into the wrong direction. On the third day, they said, maybe we should try to pay more attention to Anne Catherine Emmerich, and they followed her words, which led them to a path, and they saw in a distance some women working in a field, and they ran to these women, and the women said, oh, there's a holy spring just beyond where you are. Didn't Anne Catherine Emmerich speak of a holy spring? And doesn't that home that we just pass look or sound like it's exactly on the plateau that Anne Catherine Emmerich had described? So they went back to that place and everything was just exactly as Anne Catherine Emmerich had said. So it was some months later before she was able to go there herself and see the house. Any time that the sisters were going to go to the house, the Lazarus priests needed to provide horses and donkeys in order for them to get up to the house. There are wild animals, there are bandits in the hillside. It's not a place for two priests to wander around on the hillside. Can you just imagine what it must have been like for Sister Marie? Here she's been up all night, on a train, several hours, gets off the train, then is transferred to a horse, going for miles and miles and miles, journeying up and down the same hills that the Blessed Mother must have walked along the way with the Apostles, and Sister Marie finally coming to Nightingale Mountain to be on the spot, to be in the same exact place where the Blessed Mother lived for the last nine years of her life. And her first uh, reaction was, we have to buy the house, we have to buy the mountain, because we need to protect this. And it was through her family's wealth that she was able to send for the money, and Father Young negotiated the purchase of that mountain from the bay, the Turkish bay who owned the property. 
and really a very great set of circumstances resulted in the purchase of this mountain. But not, not for her persistence in having to find the house, her financial ability to purchase the house, and, and all those things coming together at the right time in the world's history, uh, we wouldn't have this house today to, to celebrate Mass and to venerate the Blessed Mother there. They wanted to establish this as the authentic house of Mary. And instead of getting Catholic archaeologists, they got archaeologists who were atheists and who would be most likely to rule it out as being authentic. They established that this was a first century home with a fourth century church built over it. The stones were in fact matches for the gymnasium known to be from the first century. Additional excavation work revealed skeletons that were buried facing the house of Mary, while customs from that time would suggest that they should be buried with their heads, hands, and hearts all facing Jerusalem. Numerous popes have visited this house of Ephesus, and an indulgence formerly on a home thought to be Mary's in Jerusalem has been moved there. The account of the discovery of the Holy House of Ephesus adds historical context and a great point of connection for the cause, as they look to propel her towards being recognized as a saint. But it is her incredible life of self-sacrifice and leaving her riches to serve the poor, and her life of virtue that makes her a natural selection to be considered to someday join the canons of the saints. But before that can happen, her heroic virtue must be formally declared, and a verifiable miracle needs to be identified as being worked through her intercession. We journey to Wontaw, New York, for the story of the remarkable recovery of a boy named Gavin. Gavin means the world to us. He, um, he's one special little boy. We can't really imagine our life how it was before he was here, so he's, he's everything to us. I just noticed that his right eye turned in a little bit. I mostly noticed that when he was sitting at his high chair. After letting my pediatrician know that I, I did notice there was something going on with his right eye, she suggested to um, look into it a little bit further to bring him to a uh, pediatric eye doctor. We saw the best doctor there is for this um, condition. He, kinda, he, he wanted to wait a month to see what happened. And um, after a month of waiting, that is when we discovered it was the retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is a pediatric eye cancer that is treatable through different types of procedures. However, the outcome mostly is a, a loss of eyesight. We didn't really know what we were gonna be up against, but we knew we were catching it at an early stage. But still, to hear that it was cancer, um, yeah, we were all pretty devastated. There wasn't anything that was gonna cure it, but there was, there was gonna be different things that we could do. So chemo was one of those options. So uh, chemo was an option, and then um, of course, we could have had the eye inoculated. When Gavin was in his crib at night or during the day, about to go down for a nap, I would use this prayer card. I would put it right directly on his eye and, and pray to Sister Marie that she would help us out. I, I prayed every night to Sister Marie to kind of give me the answer. And uh, I just, I don't, I can't say if it was like a, a day or a time of the day where I, I just, all of a sudden I felt like my answer to what we should do was so clear. And that was to go ahead and just do the laser, not to put Gavin under more chemo. We were pushed to go more the chemo route with Gavin just because um, our renowned doctor that we were seeing, he came up with this procedure with the chemo. He, he was really trying to guide us that way. After praying to Sister Marie, I felt like she really helped push me to the, the route we were supposed to go, and that was with the laser treatment. The doctor came out after doing the procedure of the laser and, and said that he thinks he, he had killed all the cancer cells. Gavin still has vision in his right eye, when he examined and looked at the activity in his retina, he had, his activity is just as functioning in his right eye as it, in his left. So there's no question that he can, he can definitely see out of that right eye. This is a young uh, lad who, whose uh, parents noticed uh, something uh, in, in the child's eye, a little deviation uh, of the eye, uh, which is one of the symptoms, one of the early symptoms of a condition known as retinoblastoma. It's a little tumor that that can happen at the at the back of the of the eye because because the tumor interferes with uh, with your ability to see people will will say something's wrong worst case scenario is that it's uh, big enough that 
that you need to enucleate the eye. With this genetic condition, you have to be careful that, uh, that, it, that the kid doesn't develop it in the other eye or uh, other sites in the body. And uh, the child was treated with uh, chemotherapy and uh, the tumor shrank uh, remarkably as it usually does with these cases. And uh, then they uh, treated the remnant of disease with, uh, with focal laser therapy to the retina. With the other children that were in the waiting room, we definitely saw um, extreme cases of the retinoblastoma. Um, I would, not once have I been in the waiting room and seen other conditions like Gavin's. And he, he the doctor always tells us we are the luck, luckiest family out of all the families he's seen. Gavin's genetic form of this cancer, he should have had tumors in both of his eyes, um, several tumors, but no other tumors appeared. Sister Marie, um, I feel like I have an extremely strong connection to her right now. Uh, and now that, you know, I, I got to know her during the time in need with Gavin, I, I, I use her, I, I call upon her, and I pray to her for many other things in my life. She has become a soul, a friend, someone that I, I go to. Sometimes she answers my prayers, sometimes she doesn't, but I do feel her presence, and most people who pray to her also feel her presence. And uh, one of the things that is really important is that the country that she was taken from, France, going on to Asia Minor, being a Muslim country, there's a lot of ties in there. Her ancestor, Pierre the Venerable, was the first to translate the Quran. And one of the priests at the Vatican said to me that he believed that Sister Marie was being called to be an intercessor with the Muslims. But she's also being called to help us just get through our every day and to remember to pray to God every day, to open our hearts and, to, and our souls, and to help us stay on our track in order for us to get to heaven. Like if we did not pray to her and if we didn't have such a strong form of faith, what could have happened? And um, that's, that's the scary part of it. And I, I just firmly believe that it was with our faith and with Sister Marie that we have the, po the positive outcome that we do. It's, it is because of her and because of, of God. Gavin's story is just one of many reports of remarkable cures and seemingly miraculous favors being attributed to Sister Marie. Whatever case the cause ends up submitting to Rome. Well, we have to wait for the Catholic Church to validate it in order for it to be used in the canonization of Sister Marie de Mondacrance, who someday may be one of the Catholic Church's great saints.